Hey everybody, welcome to Compline. Uh, if you don't know what Compline is, it's our Wednesday night evening prayer. Um, and right now everybody's kind of getting situated. Hey Sue, you can you grab a mic because I'm going to need you to have a mic. Um, cameraman is getting situated because we're going to use our screen, our, our whiteboard here. So cameraman, I got audio man, I'm speaking to three people. Okay, so I think I'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to speak out into the world on YouTube and Facebook and other spaces and talk about you and sing to you and, and really just try to prepare our hearts to um, walk in this world as people who honor you and who love others and who are imitators of you, Jesus. And we just ask that you give us wisdom as, we, um, as I talk and that you would challenge us and that you would um, get our minds thinking. And ask that in your holy name. Amen. All right, so uh, we've been in what a series, I guess I would call research and development. Um, and that's really what Compline is. It's, it's it not necessarily in the tradition of, of the ancient world or, or of, you know, as evening prayer. But for the village, we've taken it, we've repurposed it, and it's sort of research and development, opportunities to introduce new songs, those kinds of things. And so what you're going to get right now is an experience of what many leaders at the village get, and that is Eric having worked on a whole bunch of things in his head, but not yet worked it all out. And so he's going to put it out on a board, and then hopefully what it does is it inspires people like Michael and all of you watching to begin to try to dissect it, expand it, get me to be more clear, add things of your own, all those kinds of things over the next uh, month or two. But the purpose of it is, as we've talked in the past, when disruption happens, and you can't deny disruption has happened in our life, God, we look as followers of Jesus at disruption as an invitation to consider what kinds of maybe changes we need to make in our own life, in our community's life, and what God might be inviting us into that's new and different, and how he might be correcting us. And so, this is our process of that in this evening. So I'm just going to start with my thoughts. You can see up here the Village Church, and this is my first time to really use the whiteboard, so we'll see how this works. I'm a terrible speller. But the Village Church um, has three things that connect it, and all churches have these three things. Number one is creatures. We're all creatures, um, but that means that we're image bearers of God. In Genesis Chapters 1 through 3 indicate that we are all image bearers. We're creatures. The second thing that ties all of us together, <laughs> there's a runner. He's jogging around the sanctuary, is that we're sinners. Okay, that we're all sinners. Romans is pretty clear about this. 3.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. The, or not the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 6.23 is the wages of sin is death. But anyway... This is a better one? Okay, I got a better marker. All right, so the, the third thing that connects us as villagers and as people um, is that we're redeemed, right? That has two, is that right? Oh, okay, that we're redeemed. And 1 Corinthians uh, 6, I believe 20, tells us that we are bought with a price. Now, this is what connects all of us. It connects us together as followers of Jesus, and it fits very easily into one of the values at the village, and that is that we value community, a connection and a common unity to one another, that we're image bearers, that we're creatures, we're all sinners, and we're all redeemed. The important part of this is that each one of these also connects us to other people in other churches, and also different ones of these connect us to everybody. That's an important thing as we think about the village church. Now, the second value of the village 
is truth. And this is something that we've actually been looking at a little bit um, as Michael has been talking. He actually talked about truth at one point. But John 14, 6 is a famous truth one. It's where Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to him but comes to the Father, but through him. That Jesus himself is truth. And so when we are looking at uh, thinking about how our church is organized, well, it's organized around the truth, who is Jesus, and we're informed of that by Scripture. And so you'll find that at the village, Scripture, anyway. How do I spell Scriptures? E-R, right? Anyway, something like that. We, we learn that's how we're informed about what the who and what the truth is, is by our study of Scripture. Now, you see this played out then, and we practice this, kind of I, these, I, this idea of truth and what Scripture invites us into by practicing things that we call and then disciplines. And this is kind of what you've been experiencing in what Michael has been talking about and some of the things that I've been talking about when it comes to prayer and fasting, and Michael talking about how we take our thoughts captive in our mind using 2 Corinthians um, chapter 10, where we're to bring all of our thoughts captive before Jesus. And so we've been talking, we've been, here's where research and development works. We've come up with a couple things. I'm not going to write them down, but there's the rock tumbler of truth. You can look at that. The box and the teddy bear. And um, there is the quarantine box for your, all of your thoughts that come in your head so you can quarantine them and examine them. There's a whole bunch of other different ones that these ideas about how your mind works, how th thoughts enter. And so we've been learning to think about different ways of taking our thoughts captive. Now, the reason we would be doing that and thinking about that as a community, the village, is that we understand that when disruption happens, we need to be on guard. To be on guard, we have to be people who are of prayer and people who are practicing the disciplines all surrounded around Jesus because we know that he's the only way we can get to the Father. It's the only way we understand who God is. Scripture informs us of that. That's how we work things out, okay? But, which I'm on my eraser went. Oh, here it is, okay. That's all nice and good, but the question then becomes, and I wish I had a bigger board, but that's just life, um, is really, what's our mission then? What are we supposed to do with these things? And I think this is important, and this is why Michael has been really trying to bring things down to the really simple ways of trying to take captive our thoughts, because if we're gonna be effective in our mission, we have to know what's entering our mind and what is good and right and what isn't, right? So our mission comes out of 2 Corinthians. And there's a lot of different ways of talking about the mission of the church. But we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5.17 because I think this defines how the village understands its mission and it's going to help us understand where we're supposed to go with things. Now my wife is going to read first or 2 Corinthians 5.17 and following. Nope, you have to turn it on. Hang on. Handheld. Are you on? Is it turned on? Therefore. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, if you agree to the fact that you're a creature, creating God's image, that you're a sinner, and that you're redeemed, then 
you have to you have to wrestle with this mission. This is the thing that you're invited to do, and that is that you're part of the ministry of reconciliation, and I always call it the men of wreck, which sounds more hobbitish, like beware of the men of wreck or the men of wreck. Anyway, nobody got that. That's just in my head. Anyway, the ministry of reconciliation, that's what we're called to, and we have this an identity of being ambassadors. So our mission as people is to go out and help the world reconcile, but the reconciliation message is all about Jesus, that all things that are broken and all things that are in trouble go through the cross. And anytime we talk about anything that's broken and this is absent, nothing is going to get done. Okay, th this is where everything begins and this is where everything ends, in a sense. We cannot be reconciled to one another or to God without the cross. Now, I know I might be just giving you like a mini theology lesson, but this is important because as people at the village, now the church has this mission, but the village decided that it would call it something, say, kind of explain it in a certain way. And so we said the way that we do this, the way that we're ministers of reconciliation, the way we are ambassadors, is that we're going to go about go out and heal the city one person at a time, okay? So the first thing that we, are at, we decided that this is going to look like, this reconciliation, is that we're going to heal, okay? We're going to heal the city. So there are two things that we have to, that have to be healed. One, obviously, is sin. And it, if you think about in Mark chapter 2, when, the, when those guys lowered their friend down into Jesus' house, most likely, and because they couldn't get in because there's this crowd, and they lower him down, and he's, he's paralyzed. And Jesus looks at a paralyzed man, and instead of healing him, counterintuitively what he does for the rest of us it's counterintuitive he says your sins are forgiven that healing really is forgiveness and it's for our sins this is a, this is an important thing we have to keep in mind and that healing of our our sin has an effect on our heart and so you could say our hearts need healing jeremiah um 17.9 says, Sue, it's, it's okay. You don't have to read it. It, it. You got it? Okay. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Yes. The heart is deceitful and beyond understanding, that translation said? Beyond cure. What we have to understand that as we look at, as we walk into the world and as we offer reconciliation through the cross and we begin to have conversations about what forgiveness looks like, we have to understand that all of us, but those of us without the Spirit of God, have been operating and are operating with a heart that is deceitful and has no cure. The only cure is the cross. This, this is important. So let me kind of flesh it out for you a little bit and tell you what that looks like. Well, first, I mean, here are the, some of the, the, the things you're going to see that are, are sinful and are evidence of our, our wicked heart. First, it, it plays itself out in race, in, in isms, right? That race becomes something where it, there's brokenness. It plays itself out in our sexuality, It plays itself out in our gender identity. Right? It plays itself out in our political systems and our economic systems. Now, I want, I want you to, to see, like, the, I could make a bigger list, but these are just ones that are pressing in the moment right now. And I want you to think about the fact that when, I mean, race is a beautiful thing. 
And it's God created race, and God created us different. And as creatures, we're all connected as created, like God was creative in the way he played with our melanism, our melan, our melanism, our melanin. We, can, we have melanisms. Well, that's, that's a whole other subject. But, but what's happened is because our hearts are desperately wicked, this has become distorted and actually raised above Christ. Our sexuality has become distorted and raised above God. Our gender identity has become distorted. Our political systems are broken and distorted. Our economic systems, which involve greed and, and, and such, are distorted. So when you and I decide that we're going to be people of a ministry of, rec- or people who are ambassadors and ministers of reconciliation, we need to understand that we are walking into this mess and that we are in the process of untangling from this mess. So though our hearts are made new through Christ, it's very clear in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we've been, we're have been new creatures, but that the old is going, the old is gone and the new has come, but that the Greek in there means the old is going and the new is coming. So we are in the process of untangling by learning to be healed through the cross and the resurrection, and we are also offering that to the world itself. So that's the, the, the healing, though, is a deep understanding of forgiveness when it comes to race, a deep understanding of forgiveness when it comes to our sexuality, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a lot of details and all of that, but this is, I, I want you to have that in your mind, that the first part of our thing is healing these are some of the things that need healing, and I think I've encompassed a lot of them. The basic idea behind it so that you can think about it. Okay, so healing the city. The second part is the city. And, and here's where I want to spend a little bit of time because we're not, we are talking about Tucson, and we're not talking about Tucson at all. Because I think the city just means people, collections of people, okay? And the city actually is really where we see the symptoms. That's how you spell symptoms, right? No? Oh, gosh, they did this. Episode. Symptoms. I don't know where that came from. Anyway, is that right? Okay. The symptoms. This is where we see the symptoms of everything that needs healed. This is where we see it all played out. And so I want to talk about the four symptoms that you see in every city, wherever you go, wherever God's placed you. In modern times, these are the four symptoms that we will see in the community that are are, are kind of, they tell us that there's a problem in, in in the core I core things that need to be healed. So number one, and this is going to, here we go, the oppressed versus the oppressor. Is that right? There, this is what you're going to see. This is a symptom. There is a constant conversation about being oppressed and being the oppressor. And the oppressed and the oppressor are constantly pitted against each other. And and here's the the goal or what these all these symptoms do is that they all divide. Right? They divide us. And so there's a narrative, which I would argue comes from the enemy, that pits the oppressor against the oppressed. And as soon as the oppressed become, be, are no longer oppressed, they become the oppressor of somebody else. And this narrative goes round and round, and it's destructive. Now, is there truth in it? Yeah, there are oppressors and oppressed. But this is a symptom of people whose hearts are hardened and unable to see truth. When there is no forgiveness, then you have a constant loop of oppressed and oppressor. And it divides us, and it confuses us, and it's a symptom that race 
and sexuality and political and economic systems have gone awry. The second thing, and this is for those of you who understand anything about Marxism, this will be here, you'll go, oh, the ideology of power. And I don't, I mean, this, to put that down is to put down a big, dangerous word. But I want to say that one of the symptoms that you see in the city is a conversation about power that is endless in this sense. Power becomes the only thing that's important. And who has it and who's exercising it and how it's being exercised and what happens is this divides us because power gives us some kind of benefit. And so we're always in this circle of being, of this, you, you're, in, you're in the place of power and you need to be removed from power. Well, you're in the place of power and you need to be removed from the place. Or you're, you're a person who is just mimicking what the power says, right? You don't even know the power you have and that is dangerous. This is a symptom that people's hearts are hardened and dark and nobody can know them. This is a symptom that race, which is good, gender, which is good, economic and political systems in themselves are at least neutral or good, but that they have gone awry. These are symptoms. The third symptom, and, and all of this is for me to get you to think, the third symptom is experience over reality. Some people might call this lived experience. That my experience of things, my truth, my reality is more important than what is actually real, okay? That is a symptom in the city, in a collection of people, in a culture, that race and gender and political system and economic system have gone awry. And that the foundations of those things have begun to, have begun to crumble. And what does this do? Well, when your experience is more important than reality, it divides us because all of our experiences are different and because nobody can know our hearts, right? And so we're divided because experience trumps reality. And you see that in our culture now. These are symptoms that are in every city. And the last one, the last one, and now I'm going to get in trouble. Social justice. Social justice, and, I, and I, I tried to use a different word and I couldn't. I understand that people care a lot about justice and they care a lot about it in society and so they think that social justice is important. But, but here's the thing about social justice and I'm just gonna erase all of these, hopefully people have them. I can share my notes later. And just put social justice up here because it probably needs a little bit more explanation and why I think it divides and why I think it's a symptom of things that are broken that need to, we need to dive deeper into. Social justice. If you talk to people about what social justice is, well, they don't all agree. But it basically, for some people, is making things equitable redistributing wealth, making sure that the lower are raised up and the upper are brought down and so that we have an even. Or it's taking injustice out of a system, right? Or, and, and bringing justice to systems and to economies. The problem is nobody agrees what justice is. And if you are somebody who is a follower of Jesus, then you understand that God's justice is important to him, and you can either be, you can't be on both sides. This is what I, what I mean by this. God's justice, if, if something demands justice, 
Why am I CE, right? If something demands justice, then it's wrong. But when there's social justice, we, are, we disagree as to what is right and wrong when it comes to social justice. Because I heard it once said that one man's liberating action is another man's hell. Meaning, just because I, you know, I'm trying to help and so I'm going to go liberate someone does not mean that that liberation is even what they wanted, right? Or is going to be helpful for them. So we disagree. But when it comes to God's justice, there can be no disagreement, right? So social justice, and it can, you can use a different word if that's offensive to you, but so, some kind of justice that, that now nah, social justice, we'll stick with it. Human justice. But, but I think it's important in our culture to think about it in the social part. But it's divisive. It divides. And anytime justice divides us, we're not in God's justice because God's people are people of justice. God's people are not people of social justice. This is what I mean. Um, Micah 6, 8 says the thing that God wants us to do is to do justice, right? To love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. That word justice is a very legal term, but what it, what it literally means, I'm going to read it to you, is to execute righteousness and to divine orderliness in creation. So the only, so if we're saying that something is wrong in the context of social justice and we're saying it's connected to the gospel and it's something God wants, then we're saying anyone who's on the outside of that is on the outside of righteousness and outside of the created order. But I don't think we're willing to say that up here. And so I would think that human justice often becomes, is a symptom of something has gone wrong in the city. When people are demanding all kinds of justice and we're fighting for justice, but we're not actually looking for the justice that God offers. So, healing the city one person at a time. That's the next part. I think that's the important part. So I need to write these down again. Okay, here we go. So, we're, gonna, we're just going to say O versus O for the oppressed. Second one we're going to put down is power. Third one is experience over reality. And four is social justice. All of these are symptoms of the things that need healed that we list before going wrong. Now, the one person at a time, why is the village so into this? Okay, well here's why. It's very simple. Jesus spent three years doing his ministry. He healed people, he taught, but when you look at it, he is very much about the individual, even when he preaches and talks to big groups. Um, in general, he was a failed messianic character, but when he rose from the dead, what we find out is all of those people in whom he touched, when the Spirit poured out over the world, inside of Jerusalem, all the people he touched well, they were ready for God. They were ready for the Spirit. They were ready. And so I think there's an invitation in following Jesus that you and I are called to the individual to care for the individual in the ministry of reconciliation to help soften their heart, to be open to the Spirit of God, to be open to being reconciled to one another and reconciled to God. And so when we talk about one person at a time, 
what's important when it comes to the oppressed and the oppressor is that all of us have stories. And so one person at a time allows us to give value to individual stories. And so what happens is that we actually go after something that happens very often or is an effect of these symptoms up here. I don't know why I want to do that. Um, I want to say symptom, uh, systems. And that's why. Okay, symptoms. Is that we want to group. And we want to have group stories and group identity. And we want to deal with people in groups. And what happens is we don't actually find the uniqueness of us being creatures created in God's image. We don't actually learn and understand the stories of the oppressed and the story of the oppressor. And so we are unable then, if we're not doing it one person at a time, really to help each other see that we are both the oppressor and the oppressed. Some of us have more egregious stories than others, and some of us have to spend time in mourning and be sad maybe about our history and, and, and really feel the weight of that. And for some of us, we have to offer forgiveness when we don't want to offer forgiveness, but this doesn't happen unless it's one person at a time dealing with stories of individuals. That's how that works. That's how we begin to bring the ministry of reconciliation. The second thing is power and the ideology of power. What we don't, what happens is, again, we end up grouping ourselves when we talk about power. And then we begin to put ourselves in groups. And what we don't learn then is the impact of our own power. And, and I think these things work on top of each other. And, and so when I am able to engage one another, a, a single person, I'm able to hear their story and begin to see how my own power, things that I have, privileges I have, impact others. But they are also able to begin to think that through themselves. And what we are able to do together is dismantle it because what happens is we start talking about it together. We start talking about how we experience one another. We begin to have meaningful conversations about our gender, about how we understand politics, what we think about life, how we've experienced misuse of power. But what we also begin to do and is very important, is that we begin to depower, in a sense, power. Because Jesus faced power and let it kill him. And Christians never ever in the Bible, you don't see them in the New Testament, discussing how people got power. Only what they should do with it when they have it. And so there is an invitation when, we do, when we're engaging one another to create plans as communities on how we're going to call power itself to account, both in our own life and in our community's life and in our political system together. We can do that together. But if we aren't at one person at a time, if we're not engaging stories, that's not going to happen. And all of these things hopefully unify us at some level. So experience over reality. Experience over reality. I think one simple thing happens, that when you and I engage each other as individuals with stories who all have different forms of power, is that we learn that our ex elevating our experience is just simply selfish. That we begin, when I say that how I experience things is, is reality regardless of reality, and this comes to my race, to gender, 
to political realities, to economic realities, to social construct realities, all these things. When I say my experience of them is what is real over what actually is real, what, and, and you, can, you can begin to see this when you have conversations with people, and this allows you to confront it, I think, is that when their conversations attack people's stories, when they cast doubt on other people's experience and their motivation, you begin to, you, you have an opportunity one-on-one -on -one to confront that. What happens is if we confront it as a group, a lot of times we get nowhere because group identity doesn't have any kind of connection right, to a person. The last one is social justice. And I think when, when we engage one another, as, and particularly as we go out as followers of Jesus, we understand what real justice is. And we actually, in a sense, because justice is a practice of our religion, in a sense, we understand what it means in the sense that James tells us is what true religion is to take care of the orphan and to take care of the widow. That like true justice is not to demand penalty for people, but true justice is to stand, I would say, in front, in between, stand in between individuals, and particularly the orphan and the orphan's oppressor and the widow and the widow's oppressor, so we, we stand between them, between those who wish to, to harm and take advantage of and not care for, and at the same time, what justice is, is that we actually take care of them. Justice is we, as individuals, take on the, the, the needs and the, 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 um, the needs of the orphan and the widow, the one who is um, basically without. Right? But we don't really, if we do this as a group again, if we group all the orphans together, then it's not our responsibility anymore. It's just somehow we got to fix the system that helps the orphan, that helps the widow, and that's social justice. We fix that system. We, we march and demand something. We, we, we want changes in laws. I think that's all good, but, if, but it's not, it's like a way, way down here. What's Good is when you're burdened. Justice is when you're burdened by the orphan, when you're burdened by the widow, when their burden is yours. That's what true justice is. That's when you're saying, this is not right in God's divine order, and I am going to step in and bring a rightness to this place. But justice is also saying, God values people and you can't harm them and so therefore I will stand in front of those who wish to harm them and take the brunt of it. That's what justice is. Right? Now that may change a system but that's the route. Be and so for us at the village, and this may not be for everybody, but the way we understand being ministers of reconciliation is being people who deal with one another as individuals, which something happens then. And this will be kind of my close. And, I, and as I said at the beginning, these are all my ideas thrown up in one place so you can kind of think about them. But we'll close with this. The one person. Person. I'm not like Michael. I don't have cool diagrams. But here's the person. Here's the circle. When you engage the person you find out that the person has friends. When you engage the person, you begin to see that they deal with race in a certain way. When you begin to deal with the person, you hear their stories of oppression. When you deal with the person, you begin to hear their 
longings for justice. The people they care for. And all of a sudden, you have their friends. And you are part of their community and their story in this area. You are caring for the people they care for. You begin to adopt their longings for justice. You begin to understand their oppression. And what happens is their friends, and it goes off, and all of a sudden, it's not really one person at a time anymore. <laughs> because, but it is. And that's what it's so beautiful to me about all of this. So, I think there's some serious things that are, need healing, and there's some serious things, some symptoms in the city. And, and you probably, for some of you, you disagree with me about the symptoms. And I would love to talk to you about those symptoms. And I haven't put any solutions on how we engage those. I mean, I didn't put them in a lot of detail. But those are the symptoms in my mind, and those are the ones I want to push against, and those are the things I feel called to process and think about. Now, hopefully, as a community, we can begin to put more thought on this, and we can begin to take it and make it more, um, we can build more things that, like we have been doing with truth. We'll have some rock, more, different kinds of rock tumblers as we process through this and begin to think about how we actually do it, how we're ambassadors and ministers of reconciliation. That said, Sue is going to sing a blessing over us.